Today I'm going to speak to us from Romans 6, 1 to 14. The title of my sermon is Newness of Life. Or you can even call it a transformed life. As I uh, go through the sermon, I will also read the passage. That is why the passage was not read to us separately. Let me read verse 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? You know, in light of what Paul said in Romans 5, he talked about grace. We, he talked about the amazing blessings believers have before God. And uh, now he's into a question. What shall we say then? You look at the we, it is an inclusive we. Chapter 1, 1 to 326, two different groups we saw. Chapter 5, it became we, one group. We also said this is the beginning of new community, a new people of God. Now Paul is talking as a new people of God that is Christians. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Then he screams, by no means we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? There were two extremes or two extremes were happening in the church at Rome. Both extremes were not good. The first extreme was some Christians criticized that the gospel encouraged lawless life. As we read in Romans chapter 3 verse 8. Why not say, let us do evil so that good may come? Some Jewish Christians who were so used to following the law, do's and don'ts, in some way that was kind of antiquated, and they were still following it, making their life so miserable. I cannot eat this. I cannot go there. I cannot look at this one. I cannot, uh, you know, participate in that. Making life very miserable. So a lot of people, after they became believers, they said, this is what we need to do. Because if we don't do it, we will become lawless. That is one group. I call it the legalistic group. And the next one. On the other hand, some born-again Christians were deliberately sinning with the belief that God would forgive them. They are the licentious people. It is there in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Some people, even after they became believers, they continued their previous style of living. I have three points to make here. They remained in habitual sin. That is what we read here. If we were to really uh, translate verse 1, this is how it goes. Shall we go on remaining in sin so that grace may increase? It is not someone who does a sin or someone who just falls just once, but Habitual sin. Some Christians remained in habitual sin. You know, Rome in those days was pioneering in any type of licentious living. Rome was also known for homosexuality. And there was a place called Pompeii. And that was a kind of getaway place for men. And what happened in Pompeii remained in Pompeii. And uh, any type of relationship they could have. And uh, some of them who used to have that kind of lifestyle, they became believers, but they still continued their previous way of life. Uh, living in sin, and Paul calls it remaining in sin or habitual sin. That is there even today. A lot of people say they are born again believers. But there is no difference between their former way of life and their present way. Uh, you know, with regard to their flesh, with regard to their relationships, 
with regard to the way of handling finance, there is no difference. People continue to take bribe, people continue to have extramarital relationships, and people continue to have uh, sin with regard to pornography, with regard to, uh, you know, flirtatious uh, lifestyle. Paul would call it a habitual sin. They abused the grace of God with all sorts of arguments. Some people said, anyway, uh, God is so gracious. If I sin, God is not going to take this grace away from me. Let me just do it so that God's grace may abound a little bit more. I'm a believer. I know my name is written in the Ram's Book of Life, but I want to really do a lot more so that a lot more grace can come to me. It is an abuse of God's grace. This is what's happening uh, in Rome. And that is happening even today. There are a lot of Christians who have a habitual sin and they just tell to themselves, I'm doing it so that God's grace may abound. They probably thought that grace of God has given them license to sin. Paul very clearly talks about grace of God both in Romans and Galatians. And God is gracious and God is forgiving. God is restoring. But a lot of people think that they can have a license or they already got a license to do anything. Anyway, they are not going to lose the salvation. Anyway, they are not going to miss the eternal life. Let's just enjoy. And that is an abuse of grace. That is a kind of treating God's grace as a license to indulge in the fleshly lifestyle. In verse 1 to 2, Paul teaches that a believer cannot remain in sin. This is an important point. This is uh, mentioned in different places like 1 John chapter 3 verse 6, 1 John 3 9 and book of Hebrews. Paul very clearly teaches here in verse 1 and 2 that a justified believer cannot remain in sin. If a justified believer continues in sin, habitual sin, going to the place where he goes or she goes, having relationships outside of marriage, or, uh, you know, continue to take bribe, or continue to have a secret lifestyle, these things, if a person is doing it, the possibilities are that they are abusing grace of God and they are taking God's grace as a license to indulge in sin. Paul is saying they are dead to sin. He is almost kind of surprised in verse 3. But don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Verse 3, he is shocked, saying, shall we go on uh, sinning or shall we remain in sin, habitual sin, so that grace may abound and he gets a shock. Don't you know that all of us who are baptized in Christ were baptized into his death? They are dead to one kind of life. A dead person cannot live again. They are dead. They are dead. Um, they don't have any connection. Suppose if I say I am dead to certain certain thing, I use the word dead uh, as a metaphor to say that I have absolutely no connection. But they continue to have connection. It's kind of Paradox, a kind of oxymoron, said, how can that be possible? They don't belong to their old camp anymore. There has to be a change of outlook, change of values, you know, ch uh, change of behavior is absolutely important. It is an evidence of justification. If a person says that person has become a believer, but there is no change, they continue to live the same way they lived before they were acquitted, before they were justified, before they received the salvation. 
probably something is wrong. Either they are deliberately doing it, taking God's grace for granted, or they are not believers at all. They only have the external marks, not necessarily the internal mark. If a person is acquitted, if a person has received justification, that person is dead to sin, and there will be transformation that sh starts showing up. An aversion towards the previous way of life. An aversion towards injustice. An aversion towards bribe. An aversion towards life outside of marriage. An aversion towards things that doesn't go with God. Inappropriate to God. Baptism symbolizes one's death and burial. It is not necessarily, you know, we, we talk about baptism. Baptism, um, we, we publicly announce what we go through uh, internally. But here Paul gives a new tilt to baptism. But this passage is not about baptism. This passage about a believer continue to remain in sin, in that he uses the metaphor of baptism in which he says, baptism symbolizes one's death and burial. A person goes into the water, that means that person is dead and he's buried. And they are born into a different kind of life, according to verse 4, to newness of life. This is what we call sanctification. And the first big word we learned, and we said, you know, don't be afraid of this word. This is justification. That means God acquitting, uh, closing his eyes towards a sinner, and he says, I am making you righteous. And sanctification is God ushering a person to newness of life. A life that is different from the previous life. It is like a baby starts walking, running, Growing, then playing, and go on, and so on and so forth. And they are born into a different kind of lifestyle. Let me read verse 4 here. It says, We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. It's very powerful, very powerful here. So coming out of a baptism symbolizes resurrection. Those of us who are baptized, we did not go into the water because someone forced us to do it. But that is why we believe in adult baptism. And we say we go into water symbolizing we are dying with Christ and we are buried with Christ. And we, when we come out, we come out with the newness of life where God has invited to live with him, live along with him, and uh, coming out of the water symbolizes a resurrected life. Newness of life is to identify with Jesus' resurrected life. It's a completely new life. There are three suggestions to mark the separation. Now, in, the, in this uh, six or seven verses, Paul talks about separation. Some people even call it the holiness. The, the word holiness was talked about a lot in 1700s and 1800s, even early 1900s. But these days, we hardly talk about holiness. It looks like it is an obsolete teaching. Actually, no. It is very much part of it. If we are believers... And that is what he's telling the Roman Christians. If you are a believer and if you have been baptized, that means you are ushered into a life of holiness. Holiness doesn't mean you don't fail. Holiness doesn't mean you don't fall and trip away. But holiness means an intentional separation, 
a, a, you know, a distinct lifestyle, a transformation that gradually uh, start happening. And that was missing in some of Roman Christians. And Paul is saying, no, how can you do this? You're dead to sin. You're buried with Christ. And now you have come up along with Christ. And you have been ushered into newness of life. That means you have been separated. And you are given a holiness. That holiness is from God. And along with that, you're also called to be holy. The word holy uh, is not just clean. That is uh, what we think. The word holy is anything not of this world. Holy other. Outside of the world. That means anything this world has, the world offers, is not holiness. Anything that God offers and anything that comes from God is holy. And we talk about uh, Family as holy because family comes from God. It is not a human idea. And we say the money that we give to God and what God instituted, it is holy. And church is holy because it is not a human idea to come together. It is God's idea. Church is an idea from God. It is holy. A believer is holy because he is born from above. He is holy or she is holy. But the problem is, a lot of believers in Rome at the time, they were not leading a holy life, a separated life, but they just lived along with everyone else, and they just enjoyed everything that the world was offering. But they misused grace. They said, anyway, if I am like this, God is going to really send a lot of grace to me, so that the final uh, decision comes when I die, and I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to have eternal life. You know, they were abusing it. And Paul is saying, that is not possible. You know, Paul was not reacting and say, oh, you are going to have some loss in place. Just like other Christians did. A lot of people told me, if you don't really teach this legalism, then people will just distract, go here and there. Sadly, that is what we see 99% in the churches. They are so afraid that they don't want the church members to just live however they want. They institute some legalism and they use some of the scripture passages from Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus. But Paul is not doing that. Both of them are wrong. Legalism is wrong. Licentious living is wrong. Instead, he suggests Three marks of separation, which becomes the beginning of the journey of holiness. We call it uh, the sanctification. Or as a people of God, we are moving along with Jesus. Number one, consider yourself to be dead and be alive to God in verse 11. Consider... It says, in the same way, consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This consideration, in NIV it says count. It's little more than counting. It is little more than counting. Is You know, you come up with a conclusion after making uh, all the observations in the lab. And you reckon. That is the translation in uh, KJV, reckon, consider yourself dead. And I will give you an application towards the end. So what is ideal, what is theoretical can become very practical. The first separation mark is considering yourself as dead to Christ and you are alive for God. So all of us who are sitting here, and I am who is preaching, I am dead to the world, I am dead to sin, and I am alive for God. The second separation mark is, do not let sin reign in your body. If we have any desire, in any way, thinking about the past, you know, we have something called muscle memory. Those of us who uh, work out, we know this one. Something called muscle memory. 
And uh, you may be a believer and you've been just staying away from some place or something and suddenly you get a smell of it and you see it, you get hooked into it. When I went to the West, I went alone in 2000. And I would go to church on Sunday and I would drive back. For eight months, I had not taken Indian food. I had not eaten any biryani. And I was keeping all right. You know, there was no problem. One day, I was invited to preach at an Indian church. And they took me to a restaurant, which is very close to the seminary I was in. And I thought, wow, this uh, restaurant is so close. I should be coming here at some point. But I was regretting that for eight months, I did not eat any Indian food or a biryani. So uh, later on, I decided, until Alice comes, let me just live like this. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I would not really even think about biryani and think about Indian food. And I would go to ch church on Sunday. Still, my determination is very, very strong. But as I drive back, and m my car, without my knowledge, would go to the Indian restaurant. And that was happening every week. I'm thinking, I never even drove to this place, but how come my car comes here? And I think that is the muscle memory. Although we don't want, but somehow we go there. Although we know it dishonors God, somehow we tend to do it. And Paul is saying, make sure there is no sin that reigns in your body. The best way to take care of it is to talk to someone else. Hey, I'm struggling. And I extend an invitation to talk to me or talk to some of the elders or some of the uh, brothers and sisters. They say 50% of the stink, the poison is out. You know, if you are a fighter, if we, you are a revengeful, if you are, you know, very argumentative before uh, becoming a believer. But after became a believer, there was a spectacular character change in your life. But suddenly one day you got angry. Or one day you became very argumentative. And you will see that happens because of the muscle memory. The best way to find a solution, of course, you need to go back to the scripture. We are going to talk about it. But... You have to go and confess. In James chapter 5, verse 13, 14, it says, confess your sins to one another. It's very important. You know, just because you confess doesn't mean you are becoming a small person. The other is a spiritual giant. No, everyone is in the same boat. And if, if not today, at some point. So... Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. The third one is present yourself to God and present your members as instruments for God's righteousness. Verse 13 in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Do not offer any of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. That is, you know, our role in this sanctification. It is not going to a legalistic place. It is not, you know, just putting ourselves, locking ourselves in a legalism. Instead, acknowledging I have this issue, but I'm going to offer continuously my time to God. In other words, look for an opportunity to befriend a good praying friend. A friend who has respect for the word. A friend who will take us to church. A friend who desires the testimony. A friend who is a prayer warrior. It is very important. Consider yourself dead and be alive to God. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Present yourself as instruments or present yourself to God and your members as instruments for righteousness. These are three uh, marks of separation Paul gives us. So, in light of these 14 verses, I have 
four observations. Observation number one, legalism and holiness are not synonymous. A lot of people have misunderstood this. Some people say they are so legalistic and they think they are holy. Actually, no. They, they are not really holy. They, you know, if they get out of the holiness, they will end up in the sinful rut. So they are just protecting themselves by adopting some legalism, do's and don'ts. Therefore, legalism and holiness are not synonymous. Second one, a truly born-again believer cannot remain in sin. No. Some people sin, maybe intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, but if a person is continuously sinning, continuously in a relationship, continuously dishonoring God, continuously doing certain things that is not uh, appropriate for their relationship with God, they need to really think whether they are born again. A believer, a born again believer, will have an aversion towards sin, a dislike towards sin, a dislike towards a company that dishonors God. But if a person says, I'm a believer, but still they are hanging out with people who are continuously leading them astray, probably something is wrong with them. I would say, please check if you have understood the gospel correctly. Number three, newness of life is marked by complete separation from one's former way of life. And if newness of life is not happening, whether you are born in a Christian home or you became a believer at some point, the newness needs to be there. This is something people don't talk about and we also don't talk about. It is, you know, I was very reluctant uh, to preach from Romans chapter 6 because God, why do I need to talk always about sin? Why do we need to always uh, talk about separation? But that is the scripture. It is not that I have written, but I'm only uh, desiring to be a faithful preacher of God's word. There it says, newness of life is marked by complete separation. From former way of life, previously we were very uh, quarrelsome, previously we were greedy, Previously, we were slanderous. Previously, we were uh, giving ourselves to flesh. And we were treating people with a lot of discrimination, looking at caste, color, and class. And, you know, we were uh, putting people down, so on and so forth. That is the former way of life. What is the newness of life? Is this characterized by my conscious knowing that I am dead to the sin? And now I'm buried for this world. That means I'm no more alive. But the life that I, I have now is the resurrected life. It's different. As much as justification is God's work, a person's Christian life and transformation is also God's work. You know, one, a theologian asked me one day, okay, Subhash, you believe in this kind of uh, theology or justification and sanctification are completely work of God. What is your role? I said, my role is nothing. I cannot make myself holy. But I can only think about these things. I, I can only be uh, alerted by the truth. The truth will set me free. What do I need in this journey is not a lot of legalism, but what I need is truth. Every day be confronted by the truth. People who speak God's word. Or, you know, my conscious effort to understand, oh, this is what the truth is. Truth is, I'm dead to sin. I'm buried to sin. But I now live, the life that I have now is a life of the resurrected Christ. I'm identifying with him. And... Uh, you know, I'm ushered into a newness of life. This newness of life uh, is different. So I'm, you know, it is all characterized by the triune God. 
father just uh, you know loves to keep me always before him and the son who always mediates for me and the holy spirit of god who convicts and who nudges who takes me to the right place and he leads me towards the father the truth actually leads me and the more i know truth the better uh, walk that i have with god and it is an ongoing journey as a people of god so what is the takeaway how do we effect the transformation in our life it's very practical inform yourself continuously about your union with christ and become more aware of it you get up in the morning and know that you are dead to this world get up in the morning and say that you are in the newness of life you are you know with jesus as resurrection you are identifying psychologically continuously you have to keep talking about the truth if possible just memorize some of these passages like romans chapter 6 inform yourself continuously about your union with christ and become more aware of it this will do a lot more than legalism legalism will only make our life so miserable whereas this one gives so much of freedom god now i am living in this world not to make myself good i am living in this world to enjoy my relationship with you as we read in westminster confession uh, article number 1 it says the ultimate goal of every human being is to bring honor to god and enjoy his relationship with him and that one is continuously informing ourselves in our mind we have a union with christ as paul says in galatians chapter 2 i have been crucified with christ and i don't live any longer but the life that i live i live because of christ it is newness of life you will sometime goof up you will get angry or you just trip and fall sometime very big one but you can still get up because this is not after all a life that you are living you get up and you see god you forgive me it is different from habitual sin you know it is different from deliberately doing it and abusing god's grace may god continue to help us as we think about book of romans and this amazing doctrines apostle paul has taught to us may god bless us and god make his face shine upon us let's pray father we are so grateful to you because you have called us into this journey as people of god not that we are perfect already but you are working in our lives and we are conducting this life in the sinful world where we are attracted we carry this sinful body uh, which causes us to deviate from you and you are aware of it father and you know us that we are just uh, flesh but you have given us amazing provision of your word the holy spirit of god the church and the truth you help us to consciously inform us about the union that we have with christ by dying with him by being buried with him and by rising from the dead along with him and help us to be more and more aware of it may you give us an amazing week as a people who are going through the newness of life to this end we commit all of us in jesus name amen